Tonight, we are celebrating the beginning of the next stage of our yatra. Which is to imbibe deep within our hearts, meditate, within our minds of the blessings, the grace that has come to us in so many forms over the last two weeks and carry them wherever we may be going in the world. Krishna never takes a single step out of Vrindavan. And Krishna is non different than his name. Tatra Gayanti Mad Bhakta. Krishna tells Sri Narada Muni that wherever my devotees come together sincerely to remember me by chanting my names, I am there. Wherever the spirit of Vrindavan is manifested, that is Vrindavan, not an imagination, in truth. Srila Prabhupada writes that Many of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's closest associates never came to Vrindavan. Gadadhar Pandit was directly Srimati Radharani, incarnate within this world. Swarup Damodar Goswami is Lalita Saki. Ramananda Rai is Vishaka Devi. So many others, they never physically came to Vrindavan, but they always lived in Vrindavan. Vrindavan is very much a state of our hearts. Srila Prabhupada lived in Vrindavan for about six years, Radha Damodar temple. And he traveled around the world. It's not that he left Vrindavan. He was bringing Vrindavan to wherever he went. And we saw in that incredible film by Sri Yadubar Prabhu, that historical occasion where Srila Prabhupada, for the first time in the history, came with a sizable group of pilgrims from all over the world. As far as we know, this never happened before. People from Europe, from Africa, from America, from Australia, from Japan, in an old Indian bus. And by Krishna's grace, I was sleeping on the bank of the Yamuna in those days, and I happened to hear about their coming, and I was, I was there to greet them.
And now Vrindavan is a very international place in the world. When Yudhisthira Maharaj was speaking to Vidura, Bhavad Vida Bhagavatas, Tirata Bhuta Swayangibu, that great personalities, they are holy places personified because they carry Krishna within their hearts. Wherever they go, Krishna is manifest, and all the holy places of pilgrimage are present there. Lord Chaitanya, he is Krishna in the Mahabhava of Sri Radha, but also is in the role of a devotee to teach us by his example the important principles of bhakti that we all need to imbibe within our lives. And Lord Chaitanya in Puri taught by his example how to surround himself with sincere loving devotees and remain always in the Vrindavan consciousness through hearing together, chanting together, serving together. Vrindavan is a place that Lord Brahma through his vision, after he came out of his illusion, he understood that this is the supreme, most intimate abode of the Lord. And because everyone is conscious of pleasing Krishna, everyone loves each other. Even inimical animals, like tigers and deers, are in love with each other because they have a common purpose to please Krishna. Spiritual society is not just the form of the institution, because the form of the institution is a, necess a necessary instrument to facilitate loving relationships where Krishna is the center. And making Krishna the center is not a very abstract concept. It's very practical. It means that what makes Krishna happy will always have precedent, priority, over what makes me happy or what makes us happy. The principle of the Bhagavatam is, is when you water the root of the tree, every part of the tree is nourished and satisfied. But unfortunately, if all the different parts of the trees are thinking, I want it for me, each leaf is thinking, I'm the most important, each flower is thinking, no, no, it's me, and the branches are thinking, no, me. It's a very diseased tree. But when everyone agrees, Srila Prabhupada gives the example that every part of the body works together for the whole body by supplying nourishment to the stomach. And when you give nourishment to the stomach, every part of the body gains. On a spiritual level, Krishna is the center. Everyone has their differences. But when we somehow or other agree that to please Krishna, to please Guru, is prominent over what I want, 
And it's the only thing that's really for my well-being or anyone else's true well-being. Then we have a very, very strong, beautiful spiritual society. We were discussing yesterday devotional service in the mode of ignorance, passion, goodness, and transcendental devotional service. Devotional service in the mode of ignorance and passion, we described them in some detail yesterday. But one of the characteristics is a separatist mentality. And the definition of a separatist mentality is that we put priority over what I want than what pleases Krishna. Samsadir Haditoshana. Maya covers up the consciousness in such a way to delude us into such an insane state that we think that making myself happy by satisfying the temporary demands of the mind and senses is happiness. When we come to spiritual path, we learn samsidir haditoshanam, what makes Krishna happiness is what is actually going to make us true happy. Because living for Krishna's happiness is bhakti. It's very simple. Bhakti is to live for Krishna's happiness through service. And there are nine processes of devotional service, beginning with hearing and chanting and remembering. And our societies are actually spiritual to the extent that we come together with these common principles. And that's the challenge. That's the responsibility that Srila Prabhupada and our previous acharyas gave us. Each one of us individually to try to create the energy collectively where egoism and selfishness is put aside for the higher principle. In the spiritual world, there's arguments. During the Govardhan Parikrama, we've been discussing some of these arguments between gopis, there are different camps of gopis. Nearby is Sakistali, the place of Chandravali. And then not far is Radhakund, the place of Sri Radha. All of the apparent disputes, even between Radha, Krishna, those arguments and disputes only bring about deeper, higher, pleasure of Krishna, deeper, higher pleasure of the devotees, greater respect and intimacy for each other, and appreciation. If our arguments or disputes are not having that effect, then they're not really based on a spiritual foundation. But sometimes maya the illusory energy, gets us all mixed up. And we act very materially in a way that's very displeasing to Krishna. But the ahankar, the false ego, makes, makes us believe, because we want to believe, that this is what Krishna wants. This is what Srila Prabhupada wants. This is what I am the instrument empowered to do. Vrindavan is a place where even in the dynamics of arguments and disagreements, there's love, there's affection, because everything is genuinely 
without selfish desire for the pleasure of Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada taught us wherever we have that consciousness, we can create Vrindavan. In a purport, Srila Prabhupada explains that we have a community, New Vrindavan, which is non different than Goloka Vrindavan because the spirit of keeping Krishna in the center of service. So I was living at New Vrindavan when that net purport came out and we were really kind of falsely proud. But then I saw another purport where Prabhupada said, every one of our temples is non different than Goloka Vrindavan. And I understood it's not only our temples, anywhere there is a devotee who's genuinely, wherever devotees are coming together for the purpose of service to Krishna, that Vrindavan manifests. So starting tomorrow, the second phase of our yatra begins, where you take the spirit of Vrindavan with all sincerity and prayer at heart, you take it into your heart and we share it together wherever we go and we share with the world. Because at a time in, in this where there is so much conflict and so much fear, suspicion, hatred, greed, lust, envy, it's like a desert. The oasis of the spirit of Vrindavan is what everybody is longing to find deep down. Some know it and some don't. And we have come. And many of us, we come to Vrindavan and we get a little spiritually surcharged but then when we actually surrender to chanting the holy names and performing our sadhana and doing seva for Guru and for the Vaishnavas, we actually experience Vrindavan even more in separation. The yatra is not a vacation just to get away from material life. It's a pilgrimage for the purification of deeply being influenced and affected by the land of Shishiradha Govinda, by the place absolutely permeated by Krishna's leelas, by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the six Goswamis and all the Acharyas and all the saints that have lived here and eternally reside here. And to take all of those blessings, that all that nourishment and strength and share it with each other and with the world. So I welcome you to the second phase of our yatra. But as far as this yatra, we've come as far as Radha Kund in our Parikrama. Sri Raghunath Das Goswami, when he was excavating Shama Kund, after some time, he saw that people were washing their pots and the utensils and washing their clothes in Radha Kund and Shama Kund because there was just no other water supplies around. And Raghunath Das Goswami was thinking that this Radha Kund and Shama Kund, it is the holiest of all holy places. You should come there to worship Srimati Radharani and Sham Sundar to, to beg and plead for their blessings, not wash our clothes, our pots. So he began to dug a, dig a well. He had 
some Brijabasis digging. And as they were digging, 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 they hit some rock. From the rock, blood splurted out. So they stopped digging. And they told Raghunath Das Goswami, he said, stop. <laughs> and that, I don't know, when Raghunath Das Goswami only slept one to one and a half hours in 24 hours, I don't know exactly where that was. But when he was resting, he had a vision where Gidi Govardhan, who is Krishna, and the various limbs of Krishna are there in Gidi Govardhan. He said, the reason that rock was bleeding is because you struck my tongue, the tongue of Govardhan. Now, take out that stone, which is my tongue, install it, and allow the people to come to have darshan. And you'll see in your Radha Kund Parikrama the tongue of Govardhan. And it's said by circumambulating seven times around, it is equal to doing the full Govardhan Parikrama. Of course, devotees do both. <laughs> Every way we can somehow or other get purified and try to please Krishna and be together is incredible opportunity. From Radha Kund, we come to Kusum Srovar. Next to Kusum Srovar, is a place called Ashokvan, where in Radha Krishna's eternal Leela, Krishna decorates Srimati Radharani's hair. There are many places in Vrindavan like this Seva Kunj, Mangar in Barasana, Ashokvan, Sringarvat in Vrindavan where we meditate upon Krishna performing very simple, menial type of services for the pleasure of Sri Radha. The reciprocation of love. The lover is conquered by the beloved and the beloved is conquered by the lover. In the material sense, everyone wants to conquer. In the spiritual sense, everyone wants to be conquered. Because when you're conquered, you conquer. But you don't want to conquer, you simply want to be conquered. Devotees want to be conquered by Krishna's love. And in the process, the devotee conquers Krishna. There's also Pushpavan. Pushpavan on the banks of Shikusum Srovar, where there was a beautiful flower gar garden where Srimati Radharani and her dearmost gopis would collect flowers to make beautiful garlands and decorations to render loving services to Krishna at Radha Kund and Sham Kund. Just across from the Parikrama path, small distance from Kusum Srovar, is Narda Kund, which is within Narda Van. The story is Narda Muni, who is directly son of Brahma. We understand from Srimad Bhagavatam, he tells how he came to Krishna consciousness. In his previous life, he was the son of a very simple maidservant living in a forest. They really had nothing materially. At one time, some great 
Bhaktivedanta, sages came to that forest to hear and chant for the four months of Chaturmasya, the rainy season. And under the guidance of his mother, the little child was doing simple services. He didn't have education, he didn't have skills, but he, by the association of these people and by just hearing them, he wanted to serve them. Shushrushro Shuddhadanas Yavasu Divakatashu Ruchi Syan Mahat Sevya Vipra Punja Tirtana Sevanat. The Bhagavad tells us that when we develop a taste for hearing and chanting about Krishna, Krishna is so pleased that he cleanses our heart of all unwanted things and awakens love. And that attraction for hearing and chanting comes when we have an enthusiasm to sincerely serve great souls. This little boy was hardly five years old. But in the association of these people, he, he loved their satsang, just to be with them and to serve them. And one time, because he developed such an attachment, he asked them if he could take some of their maha prasad. And after eating that prasad and serving them so nicely, he developed a thirst for hearing what they were saying. And after they left, he was so spiritually surcharged. His mother was struck by a serpent when she went out to milk a cow and died. She was a widow. He was all alone living in a jungle hardly five years old, and now he doesn't even have a mother. Of course he loved his mother, but due to the association of these saints, he was so empowered that he understood this is Krishna's arrangement, and he spent the rest of his life seeking Krishna. And at one point, he actually he went through the jungles, he went into the cities, and then to the towns, then into the villages, then into the agricultural fields, then back into the jungles, into such deep jungles that no human beings were anywhere around, searching for Krishna. And after drinking some water, he meditated and meditated, and by Krishna's grace, Krishna revealed himself within Narada Muni's heart. And Narada Muni fell in love with that Krishna. Of course, he wasn't Narada Muni yet. He was just a little boy. And then that, that vision disappeared. And the little boy, he was so disrupted with separation. He tried everything and everything, the same formula of meditation, the same water. But Krishna didn't come. Krishna wanted to teach him. It's not by a mechanical process that we could know God. It's by the grace of God. There is no other way. Mechanical processes, we can get powers. We may even get some liberation. But to love God, only by grace of God. But he was so sincere, he kept trying. And Krishna reciprocates with our sincerity. And he spoke to the little boy and said, in this life you will not see me. You will remember that form and in the deep, deep mood of separation, you will be crying for me throughout your life and in the process through this separation you will be totally purified and in your next life you will become the great sage Narada Muni. Or he was born to sing the holy names of Krishna. He could travel anywhere, anytime, to Vaikuntha, to Swargaloka, Maharloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka, 
to the earth planet or anywhere else. And his purpose, wherever he was, was simply to give Krishna. And who were his disciples? Countless. We know of a few of them. Prahlad, Dhruva, the Prachetas. Mograri, some of the greatest of all great personalities were the disciples of Narada. But he very, through his experience, he wanted to actually witness and enter into Krishna's loving pastimes with Sri Radha and the gopis. Because Narada Muni, after seeing everything and knowing everything, understood this is the actual highest revelation of the Absolute. So Narada Muni approached Sadashiva, the original form of Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva said, you should go to Vrindavan and you should worship Brinda Devi, the presiding goddess of Vrindavan. And by her grace, everything is possible. So Narada went to Brahmakund in Vrindavan. And there, Brinda Devi approached him and told him that if you want to enter into the pastimes of Krishna and gopis, if you want to see them, you have to follow in the footsteps of the residents of Vrindavan. And by her inspiration, she gave him some mantras to chant. And he came to Govardhan Hill, to this place that is called Naradavan. And there, he meditated on this mantra in deep, deep feelings of separation. And when his attitude was completely compatible. Brinda Devi came back and told Narada Muni, come with me. They went to the northwestern corner of Kusum Srovar. Brinda Devi had Narada Muni take his bath. When he came out from the nectarine waters of Kusum Srovar, he had the bhava and the body of a gopi, Naradi gopi. And Brinda Devi then took him to Radhakund where he could actually witness the beautiful pastimes of Sri Sri Radha Madhava. Sri Radha Madhava told Narada Muni that now you should stay here at your Narada Kund at Govardhan and write bhakti sutras. Share your realizations with the world in the science of bhakti. Narada Muni expressed that I have been cursed by daksha, that I cannot stay in any place for any length of time. And Krishna told him that Vrindavan is not considered within the three worlds. You can stay here at Narada Kund forever. He went to the southeastern corner of Kusum Sarovar, took his bath, and from Narada Gopi, he became Narada Muni and resides at Narada Kund. A little further, we come to. Uh, Shamkutir, which is <clears throat> a very, very special place. The Srimad Bhagavatam tells a particular story that one time Krishna and Balaram were with gopis at Shamkutir. There is a throne there called the Ratna Singhasan, a magnificent jeweled throne that Radharani 
would sit down with Krishna. So one day, Krishna, Balaram, and many gopis were there. It was Holika Purnima. Just after Shivaratri, the day actually Lord Chaitanya appeared, Gaur Purnima. Krishna and Balaram, they were decorated so very, very beautifully. And for the pleasure of the gopis, which is ultimately the greatest pleasure for themselves, the two of them sang. And they were singing all the melodious notes of all the scales of music simultaneously. This only Krishna can do. Can you imagine the beauty of that song? We hear about Krishna's flute, the love of his heart pouring through those holes and filling the atmosphere and entering into the devotees' hearts very personally and intimately, singing to each of every one of the devotees. In a similar way, when Krishna sang, he's the original source of all musical skills. He was singing, and he and Balaram, they could sing all the different notes simultaneously in perfect melodious harmony with each other to create a song that was utterly mesmerizing. Depending on what modes of nature we are in, what country we're from, what, what our particular mindset is, some people like to listen to opera singers, some people like to hear um, bhajan singers, some people like to hear rock and roll singers, some people like to hear the, what are they, gesel singers or whatever. All different kinds of music in this world. But people are very much mesmerized by sweet, beautiful voices. Whatever beautiful voice may be anywhere, it is not even a fraction of a single ray of the infinite sun of the beauty of Krishna and Balaram's voices. What to speak when they're singing together. I'm thinking if we just do these anakut cookings like yesterday and we get enough cow dung in our ears and our lungs and our eyes, maybe we'll be able to hear that singing someday. <laughs> the cow dung smoke. <clears throat> As they were singing the gopis, and they were so enchanted. And gopis, they are the ultimate supreme singers and musicians. But they were so enchanted by this that their garlands were coming off, their clothes were becoming loose, and their hair was becoming undone. They were mesmerized, entranced by absolute bliss. Because Krishna and Balaram were singing just for them. And each gopi, Krishna, Balaram, are singing just for me. And the moon, full moon was rising, and Krishna and Balaram were praising the moon arrival and the beautiful stars in the sky. And Brenda Devi, to enhance the charm of the satisfaction of Krishna and the gopis, created blooming jasmines with such a sweet fragrance and a mild breeze that the bees were going mad. The ultimate enchantment. In the middle of it all suddenly appeared Shankachuda. Shankachuda was sent by Kamsa. He was a very, very powerful demon. He was an associate of Kuvera, the treasurer of the devas. And therefore, he had 
incredible wealth. Wealth that could never be fathomed or conceived within our earthly existence. And within that wealth, he had beauty, he had incredible physical and mental strength, and more than that, he had insatiable ego. Garga Samhita tells us that Shankachuda, he just wanted to conquer everyone in all directions. I mean, he heard about Kamsa being a great, powerful king whose arms were as strong as 10,000 elephants. So he challenged Kamsa to fight. Oh, they became such great enemies. They were fighting with their clubs. They were pounding each other, pounding each other, and pounding each other day after day after day after day. They didn't eat. They didn't sleep. They were just fighting. They were so angry. They were so hateful. They want, their only purpose was to kill their opponent. And when their clubs broke from so much abuse, they started beating each other with their fists for day after day after day, and neither one could get an upper hand over the other. Then Narada Muni came and said, neither of you could defeat the other, so there's no use in your fighting. But there will be a common enemy that you both have. And that common enemy, either you will kill him or he will kill you. So there's no use in your fighting. So then they became friends. <laughs> this is material existence. Kamsi invited Shankachuda to come and live with him in Mathura and be his special guest. So they lived. And then he was sent. And Shankachuda came. He arrived here at Govardhan Hill in Shamkutir where there's beautiful kadamba trees and tamal trees and blooming jasmine and the, the, the full moon is blazing and Krishna and Balaram are singing. It was the most beautiful environment. And suddenly this Shankachuda appears. He had a special feature that he was really proud of. He had the most precious of all jewels that somehow or other he acquired, which was worth indescribable wealth. And in his pride, he kept that jewel on his head. He wore it. <laughs> 